hopefully you guys are able to see my wonderful screen here. Um, so welcome uh, to how to learn the most technical things in the universe. Um, let me just explain a little bit who I am. So my name is uh, Jeremy Vickery. Um, I'm the tech lead at the Emerging Solutions Group at T. Rowe Price. And um, the Emerging Solutions Group is sort of like our research and development arm. So kind of responsible for identifying uh, trends in technology and bringing kind of new approaches into the firm. Um, before that, I've spent about 15 years working at a variety of startup companies. So these are some of the names of them. I don't expect you to recognize any of them. Most of them are unfortunately out of business now, but you know, such is the way of small companies. Um, but one of my companies, uh, we got a lot of contracting gigs at a variety of bigger companies. So I have some experience working for the small sort of startup companies, but as well working in the intelligence community, US Army, uh, Merck, NASA Earth Sciences, and some other big companies as well. So I've got a variety of experience um, and working for different kinds of shops. Uh, I have a background in computer science. I went to a small school in Indiana called Rose Holman Institute of Technology. Again, you guys probably haven't heard of that either, um, but just suffice to say, I've been doing a lot of programming in my career so far. Um, so don't worry if you're not a programmer, you're not getting into you know computer science or programming. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, just know where I'm coming from. Um, so that's a little bit about me, but I thought, you know, maybe think about who are you? Um, if you're anything like I was, then maybe you're feeling overwhelmed from time to time. So you might encounter somebody really technical, uh, slinging all kinds of words. One time I heard somebody say this sentence. So then I refactored the semantic query optimizer to index the horn clauses by predicate name for OLOG and blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, wow, I understood none of what you were just saying. Uh, maybe you're feeling from time to time like an imposter. So maybe everybody around you has a PhD or, you know, 30 years of experience and you might feel like, man, I'm just not as technical or as deep as some of the folks I work with. Uh, maybe that makes you feel a little bit pressured to kind of fake it like you, you know, pretend like you understand. So maybe, yeah, I remember that part of the spec uh, on our back. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, you don't have to do any of these things. You can be authentic. And if you don't know, you don't know. Um, and that's actually kind of what I did. So I actually managed to go from a junior level uh, computer scientist, applied researcher at my first company to director level. So I actually ran the technical services department um, in a matter of a couple of years, which I thought was really cool. It was a big achievement for me. Um, and I was very proud of that. So you might think, okay, well, when you get to a point where you've kind of uh, reached a milestone like that, uh, you might feel like, okay, well, now I'm done. Everything's over. Um, you know, there's nothing left for me to do. I've got the experience. I can apply to jobs. I can get them. I'm not junior anymore, that sort of thing. Um, but that's not actually the way that it works. Um, it turns out that you have to engage in learning for the rest of your life. So yeah, welcome to the club. Um, it's not important that you understand this diagram, but I thought it was pretty cool. So I thought I'd share it with you guys. Um, on the left-hand side, you see in the early 90s, that's when web technologies first began. And on the right, you can see um, today, 2020. And then the little green squigglies and blue squigglies are all different technologies and how widespread they've become uh, kind of over time. And you can see that if you were a web programmer kind of at the enterprise level in the early 90s, you had to know like two things, right? HTTP and HTML, and that was it. But these days, if you're gonna be a competent web programmer, you need to know like a thousand different technologies and a bunch of specifics about how they all work together. So I kind of started sort of in the middle here in the early 2000s. And even then it was pretty simple. You had to know like four things in order to be competent, but now it's just amazing because the bar has been set so high in terms of user experience. Now there's a ton of new technologies that you had to learn. So in my small career of just shy of 20 years, I've had to spend a bunch of time learning new tech um, and you will too. But the good news is, is that experience with the specific technology has actually never mattered less. So it's not like, you know, your grandfather becoming a master craftsman or maybe a master craftsman today where you've fine tuned your art of welding or, or painting or something. Um, eight plus, 10 plus years in a technology is like completely meaningless. So you probably see a bunch of these resumes written by people who maybe aren't that technical. Uh, you need 20 years of experience in iOS development it hasn't even been a thing for 20 years. Uh, that doesn't matter. It turns out that what matters is the ability to learn new technologies. It's actually the most valuable thing that you can do is learn how to learn 
new stuff to do it well. Um, so how do you keep up with the rapidly changing tech environment? That's presumably why you guys are all here listening to this. Um, keep in mind, this is going to be programming focused, the examples I use, but it does apply to everything. Uh, so don't worry if this doesn't apply to the cool technical thing that you want to dive into. I think you can take this kind of general approach and apply it to anything. And that approach is you can't do it. So give up. That's it. See you guys. I'm just kidding, you can do it. But you can't learn everything. So don't think you're gonna learn all there is to know. The universe is too big, you'll never get it all, but you can learn how to focus on things you do really wanna know and to nail it and really learn it. And it doesn't matter what it is, you will be able to do it if you follow these simple steps. Uh, the word of the day, if you will, if this were Sesame Street, right? And if there's one thing that I'd like you to remember is that it's concepts all the way down. That's all the world is. Um, everything is a kind of concept, whether that's simple things like trees, oxygen, wood, things we're very familiar with, or whether that's really compli complicated technical things, everything's a kind of concept. And every concept is related to every other concept somehow. So you can see in this diagram, right, the nouns or the ovals, right, these might be called the nodes, depending on where you're coming at this from. Those are the concepts. And the relationships, relations, edges, right? You might hear different terminology used if you're presented with a concept map like this, um, but those are the verbs and that's it. Those two things, concepts are related to other concepts. And the whole practice of learning is just figuring out the concepts that you need to learn and how they relate to the other stuff you already know. So let's look at uh, what a technical concept is. So technical concepts are what are called lower level or more specific. So in this concept map here, this diagram of a hierarchy of foods, you see less technical things are at the top. So maybe a young child, a toddler might even know what food is. Maybe an intellectually disabled person would still kind of have a grasp of food. Um, it's a very commonly understood thing. But at the bottom, things get more technical. So the more specific you get, the more technical the concepts are that you're wrangling with. So here, there's something called a Maris Piper. It might be hard to read, depending on what device you're viewing this on. But a Maris Piper, I have no idea what that is. But it's a concept. And that concept is related to a concept I know, potatoes. I know what those are. So I kind of get Maris Piper kind of concept. And that's basically what we're going to be doing while we're learning. Higher level concepts, again, are ones most people know. So you could draw out a concept map like this and kind of start to map out the space of things you know. At the highest level, we have everything and you can get more specific down here. Maybe you're learning about mammals or becoming a veterinarian. So you're gonna dive down way under here in the technical level around different species and the whole taxonomy and biology. But at the high level, you have concepts and relationships. On the technical level, you still have concepts and relationships. So if you're learning Python list comprehensions, right, uh, it's a Python language feature, which is a high level programming feature. However you want to map it out, you just have concepts and relationships, no matter whether you're describing commonly known things or very technical things. The challenge is, is when you try to learn something technical, this really annoying thing happens. You've got a set of things you know, and you've kind of mapped them out inside your brain and understand them. And then you've got these set of things that you're currently working out and trying to understand in more detail. But what you're going to find, and I'll show you some examples of this in a second, are that as you start learning, you're going to reach this really annoying place where you're not really sure how all the stuff that you're learning fits in with the stuff that you already know. You kind of get it. You can run Python programs and you can make scripts that do certain things, but your knowledge is going to bottom out somewhere. Um, and that little blue cloud here between the things you know and the things you want to learn is called your context gap. That's the gap in your knowledge um, that gives you the context for what you're doing, why it matters, how it fits into the grander scheme of things. So I really like this analogy, the fog of war. Um, and clearing the fog of war is directly related to what you do when you learn new things, whether they're kind of commonly understood things or technical. Don't know how many of you guys play video games, uh, but I do. And if you don't, that's cool, because I'll explain fog of war. Basically, in a lot of video games, you're presented with a map, like a mini map or an overview map that shows you the game world and where your character is, right? That's the context that you're in. And on a mini map, 
you'll have some areas of the map like this that are clear, which allow you to see where your character is and maybe enemy characters moving in and out of the territory. You have full visibility into an area of the map that's clear. But then there's this stuff around parts of the map you haven't been called fog of war. And fog of war means you can't see what's going on in that part of the map. So there could be enemies in here, there could be a giant cache of treasure. You just don't know because you don't know what's going on in there. It's covered by fog of war. So that's really similar to the things you know on the concept map, right? Food or oxygen or trees. Um, and then things you want to learn. So maybe you jumped into a course, maybe here at Technica or elsewhere, where you started learning some programming concepts, but between those two things is your context gap or your fog of war. So how do you get there? Well, in a video game, you just have to move your character there. You can't get from one to the other without exploring that territory. And in the context of learning, you can't get new knowledge and really learn to apply it without understanding the concepts that are involved in the context of what it is that you're trying to do. So this is an example of a filled out concept map. So this is a concept map about concept maps, right? And you can see that all the major concepts are here, units of meaning, cognitive structure, linking words, and they're all related to each other with specific uh, verbs and relationship words to describe how these things fit together. Um, and yay, there's no clouds here, which means the author of this presumably very well understands concept maps and understands uh, what they're for and how they are constructed. So let's do a quick example of intro to Python. And this is something that happens to me all the time, probably happens to you uh, one or more occasions. And if you're anything like me, it will continue to happen throughout your life. You start taking a tutorial, you start taking some classes, and then there's some setup instructions, right? In order to get started, you have to have an environment where you can do the work. You have to have kind of a lab environment, an IDE programming language has to be installed, things like that. So you're going to be presented with this list of things that you have to have. But if you're anything like me, you're gonna see it and be like, well, what the heck is all this stuff? <laughs> There's all these words. I have no idea what they mean. So GUI, you might know what that is. Um, Unix, maybe you've heard it, maybe you don't know what it is. For me, when I encountered this the first time, when I was first learning Python a long time ago, I didn't know what a shell was, what the heck is a shell profile. Wait up, default Python versus Python 2 and 3? Like, what's the difference? Why does one matter versus the other? Why do I care? How do I know if I've got the right one? What's a system script? Why do I need it? What's a search path? Right, I'm starting to feel overwhelmed and I maybe just feel like I wanna fake my knowledge of these things and just trudge through and kind of ignore or gloss over these details. Um, but the real thing you wanna do here is stop and say, hold on a second, this is the context gap in action. This is what it feels like to not know some of the details in the context of what I'm doing. And that's perfectly normal. And all I have to do now is just recognize that I have a context gap and then go through the process we're going to describe here to fill it in so that you then know enough of the context to be maximally valuable at what you're trying to do. So for me, understanding how Python fits in to the overall computing environment, what it's for, how to execute it, how to debug it, all of that stuff in order to fit it in, I needed a concept map um, and here's an example of a concept map that I drew to kind of map out some of the terms that I saw in those setup instructions. A um, couple notes about it is that this is an art, not a science, and that it has to matter to you. This is not a deliverable. You're not going to turn this into somebody at work, probably, right? You're not going to be graded on it, probably. Um, but what it is for is for you as a tool to use to gain the knowledge you need to then be able to do the goals that you have. So just like in a video game, clearing the map is not the point. Maybe you'll get an achievement for that or something, but usually the point of the game is like kill the whole other team's base or capture the flag more times or whatever. Your goals in working are like deliver working software, engineer great solutions. Building concept maps is not one of them. It's just a tool to help you on your way to being really good at delivering great stuff. So for me, you can see here the high level concepts that I was kind of familiar with or forced to wrangle with are here. So computer programs, user interface, programming languages, and then the structure of how this stuff fits together started to come into context for me. 
So Python has different versions and I learned about some of the differences there. I learned that Python is interpreted language versus compiled languages like C++ or Java. That mattered because Python is often used for writing scripts or quick applications, uh, usually in academics or data science, where your goal is to not have a robust or reliable system, but to produce a report or gain insights. And you usually might throw such an application away after using it for its purpose. Um, so all this stuff started to come into context for me. I learned about the shell conventions and how shells work with environment variables and profiles and different interfaces and all that started to come more clear to me, which was very helpful as I started learning Python so that I could understand the context that I was working in. So how do you do it? How did I build this map? Well, two things. The first, identify the resources that you wanna draw from. Just like in natural resources, you have pockets of natural gas or crude oil, and you need to extract them and refine them and make them valuable. It's the same with learning. You need to first identify, survey the landscape and understand what resources you have available that you can draw from. And then you need to follow a process for refining and internalizing that knowledge from those resources so that you can then deliver great stuff. Um, so what resources, references do I use? I laid them out here and I put them roughly in order of how valuable they are. So one of the best resources you have is what I call a personal tutor. This could be anybody from a friend who just knows more stuff than you, an on the job mentor, maybe take advantage of professor or TA office hours. One-on-one -on -one learning is absolutely the most valuable thing because not only do they have the resources, the knowledge of the landscape in them, but they could also learn to know you and where you're at and give you a customized map, kind of like turn by turn GPS directions to get you from where you are to where they are in terms of understanding the concepts and the relationships. Also valuable are classes. So this would be classes um, like you're kind of taking here where you're taking workshop, um, you know, 45 minute chunks and learning things online classes through Coursera or Udemy. Um, O'Reilly Online has a variety of books and online resources. And then YouTube videos and playlists, coding boot camps and the like. So a group of people or an individual has spent a lot of time thinking about how to optimize the process of learning concepts. And they've done a lot of the legwork. Um, it's sort of like driving on a highway or a paved road versus having to chop your way through the jungle with a machete or something. You want to use resources where they've spent a lot of time thinking about how to present the concepts so that they're more easily digestible. Finally, if you're new to a landscape and you have to learn lots of concepts, books and tutorials are really good. Um, you want to find books with examples. Presumably they have a GitHub link in the book or some kind of downloadable archive that has the examples in it. Um, that's really important because ultimately, right, what I'm assuming is you wanna deliver stuff that works and not just know things in your head that don't translate into valuable output. Um, and then also you wanna find, find sites. I like to use search terms like tutorial or concepts to help orient the search results around things that are higher level and that can walk me in from where I am to the specifics I want to know. It's usually I'm missing a lot of that contextual information so I don't want to start there. So I contrast those things to just searching on Google and finding sites like Stack Overflow. Um, that really doesn't help you learn a lot of concepts fast. It might help you get an answer to a specific question but you usually only want to use a resource like Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange once you know the concepts and you run into some weird issue that you need quick help figuring out. What I see as a pattern, it's kind of an anti-pattern that people do uh, at work and elsewhere, is they'll just ask a question like, hey, I saw this error, help me. And then you help them with the error and then they're, hey, I saw this other error, help me with that. And it's clear that they didn't take a step back, recognize their concept gap and fill that in Otherwise they would have learned what they needed and then they could solve their own problems. So the quicker you become the kind of person that can solve your own problems and be a mentor for others, the more valuable you're going to be both in terms of your own enjoyment of life and, and work as well as you know salary, job opportunities and stuff like that. So you're gonna to wanna to draw from these resources. A lot of those are pretty obvious, but what might not be obvious is you wanna use kind of a scientific process. I call it the scientific method very similar, um, but it involves 
basically starting from a framework of curiosity. You should ask questions about everything you see. So if you saw that set up instructions when you're getting started with Python and you said, you know what, I'm just gonna blow through this and get set up. I'm gonna turn in my coursework, regurgitate what I need to know on the test and get out of here. Well, I mean, more power to you, that may work for you, but you won't get to the elite level in what you're trying to do unless you can thoroughly master all the concepts that are relevant and getting there involves asking questions about things you don't understand. So I like to start with the WH questions that we all learned in kindergarten or elementary school. What kind of concept is this, right? That can help. Somebody might toss out a terminology like, oh, did you use Helm? Did you install it with yarn? You're like, okay, well, what the heck is that, right? Knowing that you're talking about a dependency management system, uh, it can be very helpful, right? In orienting you around what kind of things are. Knowing what the alternatives are, like what are the other players in this space? Python, great, are there any other choices? Maybe you don't like the fact that, that you have to use white space as part of the language. Are there any alternatives that have the properties that I like about Python, but maybe uh, are more forgiving about white space? Understanding that can help you kind of navigate and, and solve uh, problems down the line. Um, you want to understand where in the overall concept hierarchy the thing is and what it's related to. That's kind of, you know, the point of this process that we go through. It can help to understand who came up with something or what their background is to know what kind of thing it is, right? A great example is if you're reading a book and it's like, you should do this. You should set up a system that's self-healing and replicated and all this other stuff. And you're like, well, well hold on a second. Why should I do any of this stuff, right? Who came up with all this? And you look and it's the guy who runs the site reliability group at Google. It's like, okay, well, yeah, he probably knows what he's talking about. Furthermore, it can also help you find similar ideas and explore kind of a, a space that you might not know if you understand some biography. Um, you might wanna know when it concept was introduced, what came before and what was wrong with the existing solution before that. Um, <clears throat> this gives you additional context, which can be very helpful. And then what problem are you solving with this tool? Um, the most important step is probably to build a lab and get in the mindset where you wanna run experiments, right? Just like a scientist uh, in the physical scientist in the physical sciences needs to run experiments to more deeply understand the physical world, you need to more deeply understand technical concepts in computing. You're gonna need the right lab. You need an OS you can control, versions of things and packages you can control and understand. You need to know what versions of things you have maybe and why they're there, right? Why do you need this specific major version of React? Oh, because it introduces hooks and I need that for this part of the tutorial because it solves these kinds of problems. You'll usually need an IDE, some kind of development environment. While you can usually run tutorials for something like Python right out of some kind of text editor, usually an IDE will have other tools that help you better understand what you're working with and give you quicker access to some of the context. Like linters can help you understand syntactical issues. Compilers can help you understand uh, syntactical issues as well. Get a read eval print loop, REPL or some interactive environment, understand how to step through instructions in a debugger. These kinds of things can be indispensable when you're trying to understand somebody else's code or understand how your own code works. And then when you're trying to dive in and really fill out that context gap, what I find is a lot of people will get started with something like Express, which is a popular JavaScript framework for developing web applications or backend services. And they'll get something running and then they'll kind of scratch their head because there's an error and they don't understand it. Well, do you understand HTTP and how it's supposed to work? Do you understand what request and response headers are and how authorization works? Um, if you don't, then it's time to learn that stuff, right? Get yourself a packet inspector to really understand how networking works. Watch the TLS 1.3 handshake in action and inspect the uh, TCP segments. Get a profiling tool and look at the layout of the memory. Really get your lab and the nuts and bolts of what you're working with out there in the open so you can tinker with all of it and really deeply understand. Uh, just Or at least get that mindset where to take the next step in filling out the context gap, you know the steps and you know the tools that you're going to need, or at least you can find them out. Make predictions, right? And then modify examples and see what happens. If you've got a hello world example, right? Don't just say, okay, I got the example working. Let me move on. Say, hold on a second. 
Maybe I could print out something else other than world. Maybe I could get something off of the standard input from the user, or how would I get this out of a picture, or how would I do A, B, and C, right? Start to think about how can I modify this and make it my own and really prove that I thoroughly understand what's going on. Usually what happens is you'll screw it up. You'll come up with something that's like, huh, that didn't do what I thought it was gonna do. I wonder what went wrong. And then you go back to the debugger and you step through and you investigate and you more thoroughly understand. And that whole process, asking questions, give in an environment where you can control all of it and tinker with anything, make predictions, modify things, screw around and see what happens. You do that iteratively. And then you keep going back to resources and draw on you know, other people's help and you continue to do that, then you're gonna learn things and internalize them very well. Uh, one thing to add on to that, to prove that you've really learned something is to teach someone else. One thing I like to do, because I don't usually have anyone else to teach. I mean, now I'm talking to you, but these kinds of opportunities are not very frequent. So I like to walk around and pace around my own basement and talk to myself like a crazy person. So I'm gonna walk around, use hand gestures, speak out loud if I have to, right? Pretend like I'm teaching somebody else because it turns out just the acts of saying something or even mouthing it or writing things down or making a little presentation for yourself, whether you show it to anyone or not, those acts really ingrain learning in your mind. And there's a lot of research to back that up, that you learn something better when you turn around and you vocalize it or you write it down or you express some kind of physical action that is evidence that you've really internalized it. It actually does make it internalized a lot more. Um, but again, the whole point, unless you're gonna be a teacher, is not to just know something and, teaching, and teach it to others, it's to deliver something, right? Without delivery, a lot of people in the work environment are like, this is just academics. When are you gonna deliver results? When are you gonna have that website up? When are you gonna fix that bug? You've got to be able to deliver. And you don't really know anything technical until you've built something, right? It's okay to know the fundamentals of computer science and asymptotic performance notation and understand computability theory and what problems are in the MP hard problem space or whatever. But I've literally never used any of that for work outside of maybe a little bit of analysis of performance, right? So when it comes to delivery, the reason why I'm good at is not because I know things in my head, but I can take the things that I know and translate it to delivery. And that's really where your value is gonna come from. So in order to make sure you're delivering things on your way to knowledge, right? Executing that knowledge, you should get an internship if you're still in school. If you're very young and you're not old enough to work yet, or if you're in school and finding it hard to get an internship, give yourself an internship. Find a project that you're interested in, maybe a mobile app or a web app, a Jupyter notebook maybe, if you wanna get into data science or machine learning, just come up with an idea of something you wanna do and deliver it. Put it out there on GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, link to it, make yourself a resume and then boast about it and be proud. Because honestly, going to an internship and doing something there is fantastic and is kind of the best thing you can do while you're in school. But if you can't do it, it's still very impressive to see somebody that's like, you know, what? I'm hungry, I'm hungry to learn things. I want to do stuff. And here's proof. Here's stuff that I've built. You can clone the repo yourself. You can build it and run it. It works. I know what I'm talking about. So that's an awesome signal that you've really learned something and you can deliver. You can make your own YouTube video tutorial about how to do something and just toss it out there. It doesn't matter whether or not there's already 20 trillion videos out there. The point is to deliver something for your own benefit, to get in the habit of constraining and focusing your knowledge and pushing it towards delivery, delivery outwardly. So just go make something, just deliver. It doesn't matter what it is. It matters that you do it. Put it out there, make sure it's something others can see, evaluate and judge, and make sure that what you built actually works. One of the things that gives me the most confidence going into a job interview or going into a work situation where you've got people on the other side of the table um, who could potentially be very intimidating is knowing that you've got a reliable history of delivering working software in a variety of contexts that builds your confidence so much. And it turns out that that's the most valuable thing in the commercial environment.
So let's go ahead and sum this up. And then I want to make sure we have some time in case anybody wanted to ask any questions. I'm going to be available also in the, uh, the Slack um, channels, uh, various ones. We got T row one. Um, and we've got, you know, the general ones and all that. Please DM me whatever you want. Um, just to, you know, wrap this up, we've learned that you can learn anything because it's just concepts. Everything's the same, concepts and relationships. The whole process is clearing the fog of war, your context gap, by building concept maps that you use good resources, follow the scientific method to extract the knowledge, put out concept maps, talk to yourself, teach others, um, ultimately deliver results. So that's the kind of full framework right here for how I've learned lots of technical stuff and how you can do lots of technical things and achieve lots of great things in your own um, personal life. So I wish you all happy learning and I wanna make sure there's time for questions because ultimately, again, that one-on-one -on -one is the best way to learn new things. So there we go. Um, hi, there's a question in the chat from Helen Yang. Yep, I'm pulling this up now. Um, let's see, I'm looking up here. So how does abstraction fit into this? Since I thought the point of abstraction is to just have what you need available and to not need to worry about the lower level details. So it's a, actually a really good question because abstraction right, is, is just that. It's exactly what Helen said. So um, <clears throat> the goal with abstraction, particularly in software development, is that if you deliver something at the right abstraction layer for what you're trying to get done, then what you do is you provide an interface where the people who are operating and interfacing with your abstraction layer don't have to know the details of how something is implemented. So a great example of this is actually with uh, networking, right? It's not very common in your day to day that you'll need to know, for example, how the TCP three legged handshake works or whatever, because your web application, it, assuming you're doing something kind of web oriented or generally data oriented, you're going to open up a socket, you're going to use some abstraction layer that hides those implementation details from you, and then you can kind of just move forward. So what that means is usually when you're filling out a concept map or when I am, I usually identify where I have an abstraction layer and where I don't feel like I need to go any further. Um, because again, remember at the beginning, one of my slides said, you don't, you, you can't learn everything, right? So um, at some point you are going to bottom out and you are going to reach a, a point of abstraction where it's not very fruitful for you to move on. But the realization that you can dive into that if you want to know it is very helpful. And also it's kind of empowering because what I've seen happen, and this might just be in my own, you know, relatively 20 years of experience is I've seen people kind of get intimidated when they encounter someone that knows about things under that abstraction layer. So it's like, yeah, I built curl, I build the tools developers use, and that makes me more valuable or more smart. But realizing that we're all just dealing with concepts and we're all just building things at our own particular level of abstraction that work well in that environment. And we can understand and learn beyond those abstraction layers if we wanted to. It's very empowering and encouraging, at least to me personally, um, to be able to move into any new frontier and be confident that you'll be able to master that as well. So to sum that all up, you don't always need to dive underneath a layer of abstraction and understand it you can successfully recognize that you're dealing with an abstraction layer like that and kind of back off and let that be the layer like this is networking this is how you know the data this is the data link layer i don't need to worry about that but also know in the back of your mind you still know how to dive into that if you need to um, and maybe sometime you will need to maybe you'll get a new job or you'll want to switch careers and you will have to invent a new kind of networking thing maybe for satellites or something like that um, so knowing that you can do it is a really um, a really powerful thing. Um, yes, and I do see some chat here about uh, linking to the slides. Um, so yes, I think we can do that. Um, let's see, I'm looking for more questions in the chat. Um, 
see. Also, I'm getting some uh, personal questions in Slack as well. Um, let's see. So somebody uh, shared that they uh, struggle with um, kind of being slow at understanding things and are asking if they should start at the abstract level and break it down, or does it work better to try to understand general concepts first? So yeah, this is a really good question. And it's kind of, um, again, it's kind of an art, right? Um, exactly where to start that's most helpful for you. Like for me personally, I like to do kind of a, I like to work it from both ends where I'll try to do something first and then when I run up against a wall and realize, you know what, I'm not grasping these concepts, right? I don't really get what this is. Then if that happens enough where I really feel kind of overwhelmed and you'll kind of learn to sense this about yourself, you might want to take a step back and just introduce yourself to like one kind of level of abstraction over top. So with my Python example, um, I started by just trying to learn Python. I'm just going to dive in and try to make things happen in Python. And then I got to the point, a lot of the Python stuff that I was working through is like data analytics oriented, right? Like around data science and statistics. And I realized like I could figure out how to build some distributions using the you know stats packages and stuff like that. But I was kind of struggling with understanding some of the concepts around why a beta distribution is what it is or why you would choose that to model something or like a little bit more detail on how like maximum likelihood estimation worked because I kept running into that and not really grasping it. So when I realized I'm not going to get through this next kind of phase of specifics without taking a step back and learning some of these concepts, I took more time to go read about statistics in general and understand the math. Um, for pragmatic or scripting kind of programming, you might quickly reach a case and a lot of you will probably reach this with just general working with computers is going to be some instructions like just run this command right it's like well why did that command work or it didn't work for me right why didn't it work and you might try a couple things on stack overflow and realize oh you know what none of this is working you know what i really have no idea how any of this works right um and at that point you'll usually realize that kind of aha moment where this is a big context gap for me and i need to take a step back and i need to really learn some of these higher level concepts and spend some time in that space and then go back to the more specific space and start to explore more of that. But it's, it's kind of no science to it, even though I said use the scientific method. That's more around like just framing how you ask questions, test things, build things, and then, you know, rinse and repeat. Um, let's see. Are there any other questions from anybody? If not, that's totally cool. You are all more than welcome um, to send me you know, personal questions later, I'll be hanging out on Slack, like I said. Oh, and I just got another question. We've got a few minutes left. I left plenty of time for questions. So um, yeah, I appreciate you uh, asking. So what's it like to work at T-Row as a software engineer? Uh, do you have to have a finance background? So interesting personal background for me is I've literally, every job I got, I knew nothing <laughs> about the company like in terms of what that market was so what my first job i was working on this logic programming system as an applied researcher i've never done research i had no idea what logic programming was i ignored like those courses in college so i just showed up and had no idea what i was doing and then i got a job a little bit later uh, doing some analytics for you know some electronic medical records access patterns and stuff and i didn't know anything about what it's like to be a doctor uh, you know medical service provider. I got a job working on geospatial technology and I had no idea how GIS worked at all. And now I'm at T. Rowe Price. And I didn't know anything about finance. So what I've done is again, right? I realize there's a context gap. And at this level, it's a context gap around what the market is, right? What is the whole thing my company does? So I have to spend a lot of time learning about that uh, just part of my day to day. So that's a very long way of saying, no, if you come to work at T. Rowe Price, you absolutely do not have to start with a knowledge of how finance works. But like is a major theme in everything else I was saying, the more you can take a step back and really understand that conceptual framework of what you're doing, particularly with finance, the more that's gonna enable you to be excellent 
even on the global technology side, the IT side, at really delivering business value for the company and understanding how it fits together. So um, it's it's great. I love it. I, I think T-Row Price is a great company. Uh, we have great kind of values. It's not one of these, you know, Wolf of Wall Street type things. Like we really do want to help kind of regular people uh, make money, right, and have retirement and stuff like that. So it's a really cool place, very wholesome um, and, and really exciting from the technology standpoint as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, so Roberta wants to put a plug in for our prize category and far be it from me to steal her thunder. So yes, please do. Hi everyone, I'm Roberta Taylor from T. Rowe Price Global Technology. I'm part of the sponsor team, um, one of Jeremy's peers in global technology. We are sponsoring a prize category. It is the best use of collaboration technology. You can read all about it on DevPost. Uh, we'll be judging on Sunday. We do have three judges, so we will be doing live judging. I know a lot of folks aren't gonna be able to do live judging. So you can read all about it there. We have a priceless prize. So none of these $100 Amazon gift cards here. So you can read all about our priceless prize on DevPost. So thanks for letting me get that plug in. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, I got a question that, uh, how many languages do I work with now? Like how many can I keep in my head? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I have experience delivering software um, that ultimately makes the companies that I work for money in probably six different languages maybe. So I've done some stuff in Scala and Java and um, C++. I've done lots of JavaScript stuff, Python, um, Golang, and um, probably some that I'm forgetting about. But um, usually you wanna pick a language and stick with it depending on what you're doing. There's languages that are better suited for different tasks. So it helps to know a few, but um, one of the things that I do as a tech lead is usually like kind of put <laughs> put the fist down and say like, all right, team, we need to circle together and we need to decide on what languages we're going to use because the more time you context switch in your mind and the more multilingual you have to be on a project, the less time you can just directly do things that matter and the more time you're spending remembering syntax and semantics of a language. So I recommend, you know, in your own time, learn about different languages and understand why they're valuable and get proficient in a few, but I would say probably two languages, maybe three primarily that you use on a day to day basis in most companies today. Java is still a big one. Um, JavaScript, particularly back in engineering with Node and um, Python for anything related to data analytics and data science. If you know those three, like you can pretty much jump around and, and do almost whatever you want. Um, I see a question about is there a similarity between data science and computer engineering? So there's probably some overlap. So computer engineering is more hardware oriented. Typically the focus is on engineering like uh, computer architectures. So how a CPU will work and how the different like circuit boards and hardware will work. Um, and computer science is more the theory and understanding of how software works in that environment. Um, and so data science is really understanding data and how behavior is expressed through data, if that makes sense. So understanding patterns um, in data and gaining insights from that and telling stories about what's happening in the data. Um, so they're all three kind of distinct fields, which is why they have three different names, but they can often overlap. I know some computer engineers who are kind of data scientists as well, uh, but they work in like physics laboratories or they work for the space science, uh, the telescope institute that manages the Hubble program. So there's a lot of understanding of data from the signals and the sensors and stuff that they collect. Um, so there can be overlap, but those are definitely distinct fields. Um, and I will, uh, yeah, I will add though, a couple of people made comments um, about my uh, not knowing about a company. It's a little bit of an ogre statement. I was not an expert in that field and I hadn't commercially delivered software in that industry before I got that job. I did do my homework and understand about the company. And in fact, my mom worked for T. Rowe Price for 30 years. And um, one person also made a comment about, you know, feeling like you need to be a little bit more prepared than average in order to show up for a job. And my mom was a teenager when she had me and um, she worked her way up from 
answering telephones at T-Rip Prize to being a senior manager. So when it comes to like women's ability to advance their career, don't take it from me. My mom lived that out and she raised two kids um, because of the, the lifestyle she was able to have at T-Row Price because we value the work-life balance. So I will add that as well, that please don't let uh, anything about you know me or anything that I said deter you specifically from coming to T-Row because it's absolutely fantastic place to work and uh, welcomes everybody from all backgrounds. Uh, so. We are out of time um, and I really appreciate everybody for stopping in and please do reach out uh, if I wasn't able to get to your questions. Um, thanks very much for everybody. Thank you, Jeremy. This was really helpful. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.